In this video, we're gonna empower you to solve integral inequalities. These are typically challenging things to do, but we'll build techniques for how to solve these things in different situations. This problem, a problem on a Putnam, and a problem from the international math competition for university students. Hey, welcome to today's video on Prof. Omar. So today we're going to start with this integral inequality right here, which seems kind of convoluted. There's an assumption with this actual function. It's a function defined from 0, 1 to the real numbers. And the assumption is that the function is actually non-negative on the interval 0, 1. Okay, so how do we handle this? We have the square of an integral and then the integral of a cube. So the first thing is to note that there's actually a Cauchy-Schwartz for integrals. And it says that the square of an integral is less than or equal to the integral of the square times the length of the interval. Now actually, this is really about the integral of a product of two things. But anyway, so this turns out to be an inequality that's true for functions f. So we can actually make a stronger inequality than the one that's desired here. That's in terms of the function itself instead of the square of the integral, which is hard to manipulate. So if we instead prove that the right-hand side is greater than or equal to 3 quarters times the integral from 0 to 1 of f squared, then we're good. And the thing that's advantageous about this is we can now move that quantity that we just introduced to the right-hand side and put everything into one integral. The goal then would be to establish that the integral from 0 to 1 of f cubed of x minus 3 quarters f squared of x plus 1 sixth, 16th, we're allowed to put the 1 16th in there because the integral from 0 to 1 of 1 16th is 1 16th. We want to establish that the entire thing is greater than or equal to 0. Now, let's let y be f of x to be able to manipulate what we're integrating more readily. So the function is y cubed minus 3 quarters of it's actually y squared plus 1 16th. Now, if you can prove this is non-negative, then our integral will be non-negative. So let's try to factor this. Um, so we can take the 1 16th out. We'll get 1 16 y cubed minus 12 y squared plus 1. So it'll be y squared there. And we might have a guess at factoring. So with factoring, you can like sort of make a few guesses. Uh, you might try something like a 2y and an 8y paired. Let's try a 4y and a 4y paired. Uh, we'll do a plus 1 instead of a minus 1. If we do that, we'll have a 4y squared to pair with the 4y, and then a plus 1 at the end. And I think this works out if you fill in the gap. So you have to have a minus 12y squared term, which we can get by putting a negative 4y here. And that gets rid of the contribution of y, so we're good, we have a factorization. So this is a 16th times the quantity 4y plus 1, and then multiplied by 2y minus 1 all squared. Okay, so we can resubstitute in f of x to see what this actual integral on the left-hand side is. It's the integral from 0 to 1 of now uh, 1 16th times the integral from 0 to 1 of 4 f of x plus 1 times the quantity uh, 2 f of x minus 1 all squared. Okay, I think this is great, and we're trying to prove that thing is greater than or equal to 0. Now, our function was assumed to be non-negative, so if we multiply by 4 and add 1, it's actually greater than or equal to 1. And then 2 the quantity 2f of x minus 1 all squared is a square, so that's not negative, and so we get our non-negativity. So great, the moral here was if we have a square of an integral, we can use Cauchy-Schwartz, and then write everything in terms of one integral, and then try to prove that the integrand is actually itself a non-negative function. This type of thing is actually a great technique. The next problem is Putnam 2007, number B2. And it gives you this function f defined on 0, 1, whose integral on the whole interval is 0. Then you have this weird condition that the absolute value of the integral from 0 to any value t in the interval 0, 1 of f is bounded above by 1 eighth times the maximum of the absolute value of the derivative. This looks really complicated, so let's give each piece like a, a label. 
Let's let that maximum be capital M. And then this function that goes from 0 to t f of x dx integrating, we're going to let be g of t. All right, so g of 0 is 0, and g of 1, because the integral from 0 to 1 of f is 0, is 0 as well. So we have this function that's 0 at 0 and 0 at 1. And we're trying to find out the absolute value of the maximum of the absolute value of g. Now, the maximum then, because the absolute value at 0 and at 1 is 0, the absolute value's maximum is going to be the maximum over that interval, not including the endpoints, which, is, which happens at a critical point, which we'll call c. Now, a critical point has the derivative at that critical point being 0. But the derivative of g, by the fact that it's the integral from 0 to t of f of x dx, is f at c by the fundamental theorem of calculus. OK, so if we're trying to maximize this absolute value of this function, the maximum happens at c. So we're trying to actually show that the absolute value of the integral from 0 to c of f of x dx is batted above by that thing on the left. OK, we're going to be able to make some assumptions about what's going on here based on the actual integral. So if we integral from, integrate from 0 to 1 of f and add the integral from c to 1, we get 0 because that's the integral from 0 to 1. This symmetry is going to allow us to make an assumption about what the value c is. If we make a substitution where we switch x to 1 minus x, the second integral becomes the integral from 1 minus c to 0 of f of 1 minus x dx. And we have a negative sign by um, that substitution. But we can switch the bounds to make that the, plus the integral from 0 to 1 minus c of f of 1 minus x dx. Now, by the symmetry of what's going on, because f is defined on the integral from 0 to 1, we can interchange the role of f and f of 1 minus x. Uh, so we can work with any one of these that we choose, these two summands, and try to bound the absolute value of any one of those. So by the way they're structured, we can pick the one where c is the smaller value um, between c and 1 minus c. And so we'll pick c to be uh, less than or equal to a half. So that's an assumption that we can make off the bat. Now secondly, we're looking at the absolute value of the integral from 0 to c. Um, so we'll assume then that the integral from 0 to c is actually non-negative. If it wasn't, we could multiply by a negative sign and that would make it positive and we work with negative f instead. Totally fine. Okay, so we'll work then with the integral from 0 to c of f of x dx and see what we can employ. Now here's one thing that's really interesting. We have this expression in terms of m, the derivative, so it'd be nice to relate f of x to the derivative. Luckily f of c is 0, so we can write f of x as f of x minus f of c, which is the integral from c to x of f prime of t dt using the fundamental theorem of calculus. That was like a sly idea, introducing that um, f of c to make this fundamental theorem of calculus situation hold. Now, f prime itself, its maximum absolute value is m, so f prime is bounded below by negative m, so we can make an inequality to say that's greater than or equal to the integral from c to x of negative m dt. Okay, and that we can evaluate is negative m times the quantity x minus c. So then we have an inequality here that says that f of x is greater than or equal to this, this quantity we have. So if you multiply it by um, the negatives, we get that the integral in question is less than or equal to the integral from 0 to c of m times the quantity c minus x dx. Okay, so if we actually do the integral here, we get the evaluation from 0 to c of cx minus x squared over 2, which is m c squared all over 2. And since c is bounded above by half, we get that this is bounded above by an eighth m which is exactly the thing that we wanted to prove. So kind of a complicated situation, but the key thing here is taking things one by one, labeling things, making relationships, and noticing that we can employ an introduction of the fundamental theorem of calculus. 
Okay, our last problem is on the international math competition, 2004, day one, number two. And this involves two functions, f and g, that map the interval a, b to the positive real numbers, or non-negative real numbers. We're assuming they're differentiable and non-decreasing. In the problem, they actually assume that the function is continuous only. So I'm going to leave it for you to try to figure out what's going on in the comments. Now we have these conditions. We have these functions capital F and capital G, which integrate from A to X of the square root. We're given an inequality involving them. And we notice that F of A and F of G are actually zero. We have a second condition, which actually tells us that if we evaluate f and g at b, they're actually equal. And then we're trying to prove this inequality in bold that has these integrals, and the inequality is in the reverse of the relationship between f, capital F, and capital G themselves. So if you look at the graphs of capital F and capital, capital G, the information we're given is that at a, they're both zero, and at b, they're both the same value. So we'll put those points, what the values of f, capital F and capital, capital G are at A and B. Now, the way capital F is written, it looks amenable to use by the fundamental theorem. By the fundamental theorem, the derivative of capital F is the square root of little f. That'll tell us something about the capital F as a function. If we take the derivative again, which we can because little f was assumed to be differentiable, we'll get 1 over 2 root f times the derivative of f. Now the non-decreasingness of f tells us that the derivative of f is non-negative, whereas the square root of f is non-negative by default. So the double derivative of capital F is non-negative itself. That tells us that capital F is a concave, convex function. In other words, concave up. Similar light, g of x itself is also convex. Okay, so what is this inequality that we're trying to prove about these two convex functions, capital F and capital G? Well, f, capital F prime of t is the square root of little f of t. So the integral we have is actually this integral right here, the integral from a to b of the square root of 1 plus capital F prime of t squared dt. That's actually the arc length of capital F from a to b. All right, in a similar light, the thing on the right of the inequality, the inequality we're trying to prove, is the arc length of G, capital G. Okay, so capital G might look like this, this graph from A to B, whereas capital F, by the inequality we're given between capital F and capital G, lies under capital G. And we also have that both of them are convex functions. So by the diagram, and we can make an argument that's rigorous looking at piecewise intervals, that the arc length of f is forced to be greater than or equal to the arc length of g, and that's exactly the inequality we're trying to prove. So this problem, I think, is another example of labeling things and then interpreting the actual information that you're given in terms of the geometry of the functions.